Um, so we're going to uh, jump right in uh, to uh, listen and learn from uh, Yoad. Uh, he's the uh, co-founder and CEO of Mirror Security, and he has um, a lot of experience, uh, 12 years of designing, building, securing uh, on-prem and cloud uh, infrastructure projects in both uh, startups uh, and large corporations and global uh, markets. And one of the things he's passionate about is you know, DevOps and DevSecOps, and also on a human level, music. So, uh, Yoad, we're so excited to listen and learn from you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. Let me share my uh, screen real quick. Great. So, first of all, um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for attending today. Um, happy to be here and I'm um, happy to share with. Uh, distinguished people and uh, with you all, um, you know, the information today. So thank you again. And thank you, Gary. And um, in a few moments, I'll start exploring the, you know, the top supply chain and security shenanigans that occurred recently. But uh, just before that, I'll, uh, I'll top what uh, Gary just uh, said about myself. And um, I represent myself. So as Gary mentioned, I have about uh, 12 years uh, of experience. You know, I started from the stone era where people actually deployed, you know, servers in, in racks, uh, which, by the way, I feel the privilege for uh, doing, you know, being, being able to create infrastructure end to end from the cable level up to the application level uh, was super fun. Uh, and prior to funding Mirror, I was at uh, Microsoft where I led a team of DevOps engineers at the cloud application security group. So what made me, uh, you know, give up uh, the Satya Nadella stock? Uh, at Microsoft, uh, my team was one of the incident response groups for the SolarWinds attack because Microsoft has been hit as well. And, and, you know, post that incident response, we were looking for a solution that could do two things. One is the attack software supply chain attacks in real time. We spent... Uh, um, a lot of time on that incident response. And other than that, um, my team spent about 50% of the time on remediating vulnerabilities without any context. And that, that I will leave to Dreer to tackle at the end of, uh, you know, of, of today's uh, webinar. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'm, I'd be happy to answer. So uh, that, uh, needless to say, let's start. So I'm not going to make you kind of go through the official definition of a supply chain uh, attack with me here, right? We all know what it means, but I am going to focus on the, you know, on the peripheral part of this definition here, which is something many people, um, they disregard uh, when talking about open source security. So it's important to say that supply chain doesn't only include vulnerabilities in the packages you use, there's a host of other vectors you should adhere to when trying to enumerate uh, uh, you know, the possible attack surfaces that uh, stem from those open source usages or your CI CD pipelines. Now, the bottom line of this talk, the kind of uh, uh, why should you care is the, uh, is the immense increase of software supply chain attacks happening in recent years. Uh, which are as important as uh, vulnerabilities, in my opinion, if not more. And we're kind of, you know, four years after the post kid attack, solar wind, right? But attacks are still increasing. In my opinion, it has two reasons. The first one is simple. Um, more and more companies are relying on open source software in their day-to-day -day work. And even most of the software is comprised of uh, uh, open source because it's as, sim it's as simple as using, um, I don't know, a CSS utility, utility library, um, all the way to actually, you know, using li uh, databases and critical infrastructure. Um, it's the way of the world today, and it's here to stay, in my opinion. And the second one is a little bit, uh, I'll say, more elusive. Performing attacks via the network perimeter is not as effective as it used to be. Breaching the outer layer of security of the organization, it's, it's much harder than it used to be. So if you guys remember uh, those days where 
it was actually easy to find an uh, open Tomcat server and go, you know, that server slash admin and then go admin, admin, and you're in and that's it. You can, you're in the organization and you started traversing from there. Now, with those kind of attack vectors slowly drying up, attackers turned uh, uh, to where the new meat can be found, which is open source. Now, let's talk about the uh, core difference between what is a normal vulnerability and what we consider a supply chain attack. So first, as mentioned, vulnerability is usually a mistake done by a developer, which turns to either a zero day or just straight up a CVE, where a supply chain is actual malicious code by definition. It's guaranteed to, to run or be exploited. Um, and the second difference is the detection. It's easier to know whether a vulnerability exists in your code since it has a CV and it identification that can be tracked by your neighborhood SCA or maybe your SAS. It really depends if it's first party or third party. The trickier differentiation is how to defend against it. While a vulnerability can usually be detected and then remediated, Supply chain attacks can come uh, in various forms and harder to detect, even as they happen. And um, I think that SolarWinds, uh, the Orion attack, was persistent in the company for about a couple of years before even executed because it's very, very quiet. Now, one last small comment here. Uh, while a zero day is in fact a vulnerability that has the characteristics of a supply chain attack, we choose to include it within the category of vulnerabilities since normally there is no way to remediate it until it's actively discovered. And by then it might be already exploited uh, like we've seen with the movie attack. Okay, let's start with the main juice of the lecture. We're going to first categorize some um, different types of supply chain attacks. Um, and we'll go from easy to complex and then we'll quickly, quickly double down on each of those. At the end, I'm going to show you uh, a less, the less kind of attack um, uh, uh, in kind of a real life scenario. Bear with me. It will be at least as fun like a vacation in your favorite destination or a Beyonce concert. It really depends what you like more. Okay, let's start with the easy one. Uh, malicious code in the repository. Um, and you can see the image on the left side of like the script kitty. Why? Because it's not very sophisticated, right? Uh, but it can still try to hide. Uh, let's say, uh, like you see here, we have the encrypted or encoded code, for example, um, which might help you and try and hide the code, or you'll, although you can decode it and see it. Or... You can put the attack in a transitive dependency because let's say I have, a, I have a project and somebody adds a dependency. It's not immediately that I will be suspicious of that. Um, and we've seen that in the case of the protest where you can see it with the Node IPC. So Node IPC is a popular package to help with uh, uh, process communication uh, in Node. And in protest of the Russia uh, invasion to Ukraine, the author of the package intentionally added malware uh, that targets Russian and Belarusian IPs. And what the code does, it attempts to geolocate where it's uh, running. And if it discovers it's running uh, within uh, Russia or Belarus, then it attempts to replace the contents of every file on the system with a Unicode heart character. Um, why, why do I say it's, uh, it's not as uh, hard to detect? Because let's say I have an automation for it, right? Why would I have encrypted code? Why would I have an encoded code in the uh, library? Uh, why do I have system calls to the operation system, right? And of course, depending on the library, why do I have network calls on the late, latest commit? So I have a bunch of um, kind of behavioral analysis or anomalies that I can easily detect with probably a low uh, false, raised, uh, false positive rate. Let's move on. Typo squatting, you've heard that word a lot lately. What is typo squatting? So this one is a bit more complex. So let's say you have um, one of your developers might go to a blog and um, he, he needs to kind of uh, uh, do a new task that, he boss, that his boss gave him and he sees a great library that does that, right? Because that's what we do eventually. 
Then he goes and he copy paste that from the internet. And then the attacker can hide in this, close, this uh, blog post that he written, he can hide a Unicode character. And then he can just switch the letters or instead of requesting Python, he can do request with a Z. Or in this case, maybe you made a mistake and you and you did uh, you you wrote Falsk instead of uh, Flask, which is again which is a Python uh, library for a web application server. So it's not a complicated, and it kinds of it relies on people to do mistakes. And uh, but we did see a lot of downloads on those kind of campaigns uh, on the internet. Still, it's not that hard to detect because we can use a lot of kind of uh, uh, text, text similarity techniques. And then when we see two, two uh, dependencies or libraries that uh, has a similar name and similar functionality, we can check the GitHub amount of stars, the popularity, the amount of contributors. We have a lot of factors that we can put in in order to actually detect those kind of attacks. Let's move on. Going a deep deeper, dependency confusion. You might hear this one as well. So what is a dependency confusion? Let's say you have an uh, internal package in the company. So we have Vitaly from JFrog, which is, uh, sorry for doing good publication, but JFrog in my opinion is the, is the be best artifactory server there is uh, today. And you have it installed and then you have uh, packages within your uh, uh, company that you host internally. And you want to use that. But let's say this package is named Yoad, and now Yoad is not found in the public repository in PyP or NPM. If I then uh, create a package repository named Yoad, automatically the code will try and fetch it from the uh, external repository first. Now, this has been fixed in many repositories, or at least configurable, because you, if you have an internal package, you probably want to download this one, right? Um, so it was Alex Bearson here that actually found this uh, uh, kind of vulnerability. And we've seen it recently also with, uh, with the PyTorch that was uh, compromised. Somebody changed, uh, uh, created uh, a similar package in the PyP repository. And instead of going to the internal index, um, the actual code went to the external repo and it's been downloaded for 300, uh, uh, three, uh, 2,300 times during the period it was available. And this is a nightly download, so it's crazy. So we can see the amount of downloads, but it's still opportunistic. Why? Because you need that name to be available, but that's uh, much, much like uh, likely to still happen. So if just uh, as a, a matter of uh, kind of making sure it doesn't happen, if you create a, an internal package, Make sure you, there's nothing uh, external in the in the world that's uh, opening on the internet on the external repositories. This one probably is one of the largest attack we've experienced. Now, I'm just kidding because I know we're already uh, I think ten minutes into the. I just want to make sure that uh, nobody is falling asleep on me. Don't worry, I'll be done in about two hours, so we can uh, uh, keep going. <laughs> go. But this is this is Sammy. This is our. Uh, actually dog office, which we uh, love very much. Okay, let's go to the fun part. 3CX, so everybody heard about uh, Mark, solo wind. Yeah, Mark, yeah, I'm sorry, but we can see, maybe maybe we can see just the software supply chain attack types. This is the, the, the slide that we can see now. If you are changing the slide, oh, now we can see the oh, other you've slides. Oh, been you've been seeing just the, so oh, okay. So please uh, start from here. Continue from here. Okay, great. You can still see what do you see now? If I if I uh let's see if I change back. The malicious code in the repo. The malicious code in the repo. And now the CI CD. What can no. you see now? No, it's not uh, it's not changing. No, is it a CI CD attack or the malicious code in the repo? Very strange. Let me you want to reshare? Yeah, I will. Thanks. What can you see now? We can see the Gary screen. Oh, it says that it's loading. The screen share is loading. Let me let me try again. Mm 
malicious code. I see it's loading, so it's very weird. So maybe Gary, if you wanna share from uh, your computer, let's see if it if it works. Yeah. Yeah, I am a uh, screen sharing now. I see malicious code in the repo. Uh, you can can you see CI CD attacks now on uh, on my share? No, still the no, same. I'm 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 uh, I'm screen sharing now, and I have malicious code in the repo. Okay, can you go to CI CD attacks? It's a few slides. Typo squatting. Keep moving. Another one. And then the, another one. Okay. Great. Um, great. So we can we Please can give you are the control to uh, to change the slides. Yeah. So um, I, I'm a, I'm controlling the slides at the moment. Okay, you can give me control or I can just tell you next if you want. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've been doing. Okay. Let's do that. Okay, so let's talk about the CI CD attacks. Um, so again, everybody heard about SolarWinds. And let's talk about the 3CX attacks. It's only 200 employees. How can they expect that attack? You know, and it was a double supply chain attack. So what happened is that an employee actually, actually downloaded a malicious uh, 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 compromised package from uh, trading technologies to his computer. So the, actually the UNC group, the North Korean group, they waited to see who is going to download that kind of package to, uh, to his computer. And then when, it, when they managed to do that, they started a network tra traversal. So they got to a 3CX company and they started a network traversal and eventually, they managed to get into the build environment, as you can see here, and they managed to go to the uh, actually desktop app and compromise this one. And when they've done that, it eventually got to the uh, actual um, victim. So what's the problem here is one, the impact. Think about it, I compromise only one company and I'm able to get to a lot of other companies, right? Uh, which I think is the most crazy effect that you can have in the attack. And the second thing is that um, it's very, very hard to kind of uh, detect those kind of attacks because it's quiet. It isn't found in the source code and it's hard to see if there's anybody in your company. So. Again, it's very uh, complicated to uh, distinguish that. Gary, we can uh, uh, continue to the next slide. Great. Um, let me see if I can uh, remove the annotation because I don't see the option. Okay. Let's clear that one. Great. Distribution server attack. So I don't know how many of you have heard about the jump cloud attack. Again, 600 people company. Is it more complex? Is it less complex? Let's talk about it. So again, uh, the UNC, the North Korean group, they targeted uh, uh, an employee inside of jump cloud uh, company. And what they did when they managed to get in, they uh, did a traversal to the uh, environment and they were looking for the command framework. Now the command framework is actually the server that sends commands to the uh, endpoint because Jump Cloud is a company that manages your endpoint. Um, and when I can send malicious code, I can actually send malicious code to your endpoint and run commands on that. And that's exactly what happened. So in that case, they targeted specific customers uh, of uh, Jump Cloud, but they can, in the same manner, uh, attack all of the other uh, uh, all of the other customers as well. So this is again very complex. How do you detect that? It? Because it's not in the source code. It's not vulnerabilities. It's on a random server that gets to you. And then, how do you know that you have this kind of attack? 
And the last one, um, uh, if Gary, can you continue, please? This one um, is the one I'm going to show you uh, a demo of. Why is that? Because it's less complicated than the two before, but it's still hard to detect. So UA parser, let's talk about this one first. You can see the amount of downloads that happened uh, uh, on a weekly basis. So what happened there is basically uh, an, a maintainer was compromised. And then what happened, the attacker uploaded a new package that he compiled on his computer to NPM. Now, how can you know if something is uh, wrong with that? Even in the ledger attack that happened three weeks ago, the code looks legitimate. It isn't found in the repo. You can't really see it in the uh, uh, Git history. So it's just a former ledger employee that fell victim to a sophisticated phishing attack that gained access to their NPM account. And he published a, a new package and he caused uh, uh, $600,000 uh, to be withdrawn from cryptocurrency wallets. So those kind of attacks that are not found in the repository are not vulnerabilities are very, very hard to uh, track. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna try and uh, uh, share my screen again. Gary, please, uh, please uh, stop sharing your screen. And you add, you can uh, share now. Now we can see your screen. Okay, great. So, Let's talk about the, the scenario for, for a second. If we take the UA parser scenario or the ledger key, we did the same. We built an uh, uh, um, ASP.NET application, just a, a web application eventually. And what this application does is just a simple uh, login page. Let me connect so I can uh, show you real quick here. What we did did is we added two dependencies. One is legitimate, the sharp compressed package, and the other one, Trilog, which mimics another library. And okay, this library is a logging library in C sharp. What we did is it we, we upload that to NuGet, and you can see if there were any vulnerabilities, you could see it here, but there are zero vulnerabilities. Why? because we, di we didn't push any vulnerability. We just pushed malicious code that is, that is uh, guaranteed to run as soon as I start the application. Another thing we've, we've done, so you can see 511 downloads. It wasn't me. Somebody actually downloads this thing. Now, if I go ahead, we've put a, the, the repository that we attach to that package is an actual, uh, the, the real repository. So if uh, a legitimate person goes in and he sees this repository, it is, it's a nice amount of stars, good work. We have contributors, you know, um, everything seems legitimate. I, I can use that, that package, right? But it's not really the source repository that we use. If I go ahead and I open this application, so it's just a login screen. But as soon as this application is started, I can run remote commands on this computer. So that's the big, big difference. It's not uh, log4j that was a mistake that I need a set of conditions. It's actually exploitable by default. What's the problem? How do you detect those kind of things? If I go ahead to the repository, you can see we have two problems here. One is a medium uh, vulnerability in the shard compress, the second dependency we have here. But the second thing is you can see that we have code injection. So the way we can detect those kind of problem is by doing two ways. Either we can implement security on all of the open source in the world, and then we can verify each and every step from the source repository, from the code level until production. Maybe we can do attestation. Maybe we can verify that nobody manipulated uh, uh, our package in any way. But it's hard to do that because open source is free. We don't pay them any money. They're doing a lot of work for us and we need to validate that on the consumer side. But how do you do that? What we've done here basically is that we took the binary, took the actual package, the DLL, 
we reverse engineer it, and we actually got an ugly bytecode out of that. On that bytecode, we can do a lot of things. So what we've done is we actually ran a few models on that that they actually know to revert it back to the source code and compare it to the original source code. And this way, we actually detect that this binary, it wasn't created from the legitimate source code. That's one thing. And the second thing is that it contains malicious code. And you can see the reverse shell that I shown you in the demo, it's located here. So this is very important to understand that when you're downloading uh, things from the internet today, don't trust the package. They can manipulate you. They can put whatever source code they want in, in few of the package managers, of course. Um, a maintainer could be compromised like happened three weeks ago or like that when with the UI parser package. So you have to understand and clearly validate each and every package you use. You have to validate that your CI CD is protected and Vitaly will speak about uh, great ways how we can actually gain more confidence in our development and our packages and our so software supply chain. Um, yeah, I hope it was uh, um, uh, interesting. I'm happy to, to understand if anybody has uh, any questions. Uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, interesting things that you talked about is, you know, CI and CD attacks and, you know, what is the remediation for something like that? Good question. So if it's a package, what if it's an open source package, the remediation could be anything like in vulnerability. The problem is that I kind of lost trust in, the, in this uh, open source package. So a quick remediation just to kind of uh, conclude the downtime is to kind of uh, revert back to the previous version, which we uh, think is legitimate. If we have the same attack on our CI CD, that's a, a, a red, red light, and we need to stop everything and start incident response because we don't really know where it's coming from, right? So we need to understand where the uh, attack is come, kind of coming from. Um, so yeah, that that's basically it for that. Gary, there, yeah. are, some questions. <laughs> Gary, there are some questions in the Q&A by Nadav. Um, it's, uh, Nadav, is, can you uh, read them, Lior? Uh, yes. It's uh, not showing up in, in my Yes, of course. So, so uh, you are, Nadav is asking why all that cannot be done in the major repos like the NPM and the MVM? Uh, good, good question. Um, because like, like, uh, like our staff as a uh, consumer, uh, it's hard to detect malicious code, right? So. We can detect malicious code on the repository level, but we see um, more and more attacks going on the binary level. So the way that NPM and the other package managers uh, are trying to kind of uh, handle those, those attacks is by forcing um, security controls like two-factor authentication um, and then maybe signing and other tempering methods. But the problem is that we're still, still happening with sophisticated spear phishing that people still able to um, manipulate and, and get access to a maintainer account. And then what, what happens is that when we have the binary, even for the package managers, it's it's hard to understand because it's if it's JavaScript or transcript, it's, uh, it's transpiled or it's compiled in the case of Java or uh, C Sharp. And when it's already compiled, it's really hard to understand where is this source is coming from. They do try to make the maintainers um, do attestation from source to package, but we're not seeing a lot of cooperation yet. I hope the world gets that as, as we evolve. But again, that's a lot of work that needs to be done on the open source maintainer level. And the consumer side, it's harder to detect. We also have uh, an interesting question about container and code side signing. Is, is that enough? Um, so yes, yeah, as, as, as I mentioned, um, code signing is great. So as soon 
as we've packaged the, the package, as soon as it's compiled and we can sign it, it's harder than from, from the signing uh, uh, stage when until it goes to production, you can validate that the signature is not manipulated. The problem is on the part of the compilation be, because before it's compiled, it has a lot of way to, um, to go through. And Nadav asked about uh, uh, initiatives like uh, Guac and Salsa that Vitali will speak about uh, soon. Very important. So as I mentioned, the, uh, Salsa uh, will, will indeed help us um, we're doing kind of attestation. The problem is that everybody in the world that distributes software has to adopt that. And since we have a lot of ways to build software, right? And a lot of languages, uh, it makes it a bit complicated, but uh, I hope we'll, we will be getting there as soon as we, uh, uh, as, as, as the software development world uh, evolves. I hope it turns on that, feel free. Yeah, and, and you may have touched on this, but you know, why uh, is looking at artifacts uh, or source code uh, only not enough to validate the software and prevent supply chain attacks? So um, as I've shown in the, um, in the previous slides, uh, looking only at the source code is not enough again, because a lot of the attacks are not on the source code level because it's visible, it's, uh, it's much, much uh, easier to detect on the source code level. That's why attackers going on the binary level. And then if we're looking only on the binary, just comparing signatures uh, from binary to binary, it's not enough because we actually need to compare the binary and understand if the binary has been compiled from the source code it was intended to be compiled from. And, and again, if I'm going back to Nadav's question, I, I uploaded a package here and the, the source code I put is totally different and Nougat allows me to do so. So why should, why an attacker wouldn't take advantage of that if he can or she? Yeah, and Zika is asking a very interesting question here. The binary scan challenge is widespread in C, C++ dev languages. What, could be the solution for that using, you know, package managers like Conan? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question. CCPP, wow, that's uh, that's very, very complicated. And, and I've seen, you know, a few of our customers, they, all of them, they use different. So one might, one might use Conan or another package manager. Others also use uh, um, uh, uh, sub-modules from Git. They don't even use the package manager. They, they just bring the package into their own Git repository and use it from there. So CCPP makes this world much, much more complicated. And it's a, it's, its own challenge. Well, this, this is really interesting. Um, Nadav is saying that Nugget can easily identify that you know, with hash incompatibility. Does that make sense to you? It really depends. So. It, what are you comparing the hash to? Because if you're comparing that, if there's no release on GitHub, uh, so you don't really have anything to compare it. If there's a release, then you actually need to compare those releases uh, uh, back to its own releases. But in this case, you can see this is uh, this is a version and it didn't detect anything. Uh, so there's no there's no incompatibility between the hash because the the source repository is totally different. Well, uh, this has really been fascinating. You know, thank you so much. And um, uh, if people want to get uh, back in touch with you, what's the best, best way to do that? Uh, so, yeah, it's just my um, first name, Yoad. It's Y-O-A-D and at mirror.security, mirror with a Y. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh,